Matthew chapter 12, 46 to 50. I'm going to be reading from the service sheets. He was still speaking to the crowds when suddenly his mother and brothers were standing outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, look, your mother and your brothers are outside standing wanting to speak to you. But he replied to the one who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, that person is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of the Lord. Well, like I did at the earlier service, let's kick off with a brief history lesson. Why do we just say that call and response? Where did that come from? Ash Watt was up here and he just piped up this morning and said, I haven't got a clue, Bernard. But really, that came from the Reformation. And it came from the Reformation because as you did morning and evening prayer and your services together, people in the pews didn't have a prayer book and didn't have the Bible. And if they did, more often than not, they couldn't read. And they wanted people to work out which were the words that were God's words and not just the words that Bernard made up so he could fill out 20 minutes. And so at the end of the Bible reading, you'd say, this is the word of the Lord. Everyone would say, thanks be to God. So you knew that what came next was not in the Bible but was the opinion of the preacher or the service leader. So it's to help us to remember those kind of things. This is the word of the Lord. We've just heard God's word read. Thanks be to God. Let's spend some time thinking about it now. So let me lead us in prayer, and we're going to dive into that together. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks that we can give thanks to you for it. Thanks that we can sit here and have it read to us, uh, read it for ourselves, have it taught to us, Uh, at different levels and different ways. Thank you for the image of family that we receive today. Father, we're here from many different biological families that have had very many different weeks, but you've brought us together as your eternal family with the people we will spend forever with. Father, please remake us in the image of our oldest brother, Jesus, who bears your image perfectly. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, there's a sermon outline there on page two and the passage, and there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end, but it's been a big week for Jesus and those listening to him. It's been an intense week, an intense series of interactions that have really hit the heights of conflict, Uh, from a healing that restored a man but placed a bounty on Jesus' head through to a strategic withdrawal from the murderous intent of the religious authorities, a reminder about the nature of Jesus and why he's come, a discussion about the power Jesus uses and the slanderous accusations made against him, finishing with a really blunt rebuke and a warning to the religious leaders about their eternal fate. It's been a big week, been an intense week of conflict And it hasn't just been the religious leaders that Jesus has been dealing with. There are two other groups watching, aren't there? There are the disciples, the 12 and others who have joined to Jesus in a wholehearted way, committing to him and his mission. And then there's been the crowd, that huge mass of, really, it's just a bunch of human seagulls following the chips around and enjoying what they see. Three audiences. It seems to me that when we get to this point, There's a very important question that's implied. If those men, if those men, the professional God's people, aren't in God's kingdom, who is? If those men who can trace their family tree all the way back to Abraham, if they aren't in God's family, then who is? Who could possibly be in God's family? And at this point, Jesus' family turns up. Look there at verse 46. He was still speaking to the crowds when suddenly his mother and brothers were standing outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. Point two on the outline, it's a pretty stark picture, isn't it? And Matthew, I think, wants us to grasp this living illustration. Jesus is teaching. 
Uh, the assumption is it follows on from what we've just seen with that episode last week. And I think we've got to realise Jesus is operating under a fair bit of stress here, isn't he? He's talking last week with people who've put a bounty on his life, the threat of death. And so he continues to teach, but this time we're told who he's teaching. Did you notice that in verse 46? He's teaching the crowds, that huge mass of people that follow Jesus around who are equally entertained by him and confused by him. The three crowds are there, the three audiences. Jesus' family arrives. Look, that's literally what Matthew says. We miss that. So many of the translators don't translate that word. In fact, it's the most common word in Matthew. Look, look, look. Our attention's drawn to them. Mary and Jesus' brothers. But our attention's drawn to where they are. Did you notice that, the repetition of that word? Where are they? They're outside. Outside. You've got an inside-outside distinction here. It's been there right throughout this passage this section, this series of conflicts. Remember verse 30, if you're not with me, you're against me. And the way in which Matthew paints this picture raises the question we just asked. Jesus' biological family is outside. Who possibly could be inside? And whether we like it or not, that's a distinction constantly drawn in the Bible for us, isn't it? Jesus draws it continually. Who's in God's people? Who's outside? Jesus himself makes that observation a huge number of times. The actions of the religious leaders, that's painted their position very clearly, hasn't it? They're outside. They accuse Jesus of being the the work of the devil. Uh, the, the, The crowd, they're still making their mind up and the disciples are very clearly inside. I think at this point, Matthew wants us to grasp at least this. Being inside is not connected to your genes, your family heritage, or your biology. Just look at Jesus' family at this point. They're outside. Jesus is told of the situation. He's told of his family's request, and he responds. Look there in verse 48. He replied to the one who told him, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? It's the question we're asking. It's the relevant question. It's the question that's been raised by the conflict we've just dealt with. It's the question raised by the physical picture Matthew has just painted. It's the question that the Sermon on the Mount posed, remember two years ago when we kicked this series off? It's the question each of the three audiences have to deal with. I think we need to be careful at this point about a number of things before we go further. The first is this. Don't misapply what Jesus is about to say. My natural response is, you little ripper, Jesus has given me a tool now to work who's in and who's out. So I can divide people because I like to do that. I like to work out who's inside and who's outside. I don't think that's what Jesus is doing here. Jesus' intention at this point is to paint a warm picture, a careful picture, a description of what it means to be part of his family. And it stands in sharp contrast to the religious leaders who spend every one of their moments saying you're in and you're out. That leads into the second thing we need to notice here. And we need to notice the tense that Jesus uses. Now, it is a tense situation. But we're not talking about the emotional mood of the room. We're talking about the time that Jesus uses as he answers the question. I know it sounds particular, but it stands out. As Jesus asks the question and as Jesus answers the question, he uses the present tense. He uses the present tense. I think it's important to grasp that because he's not telling people how you can get into his family in the future. He's not telling you the entry gate. He's describing what the family looks like now. In the present, what the family likeness is. And with that in mind, we need to notice his language because it's really striking. When Jesus kicked off in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 
his first major teaching section, it was all about citizenship, political membership, being in the kingdom. But in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, he suddenly starts using family language, father-child language. Remember the Lord's Prayer? How to understand your religious deeds in front of your Father in heaven who already knows what you need. And he returns to that kind of language now. Family language is so important for us, isn't it? Just think about the media this week and the story that's dominated the media. It's been all about a family, hasn't it? The firm, the royal family. And every time language is used to do with that, we have an emotional response, don't we? Either, gee whiz, I wish my family was like that, or gee whiz, I'm glad my family isn't like that. Family language is important. It's emotional. It cuts to the core of who we are in terms of our belonging. So when family language is used in the Bible, please pay attention. It's used right throughout the New Testament. Remember our series on Ephesians, the household of God? That stuff there in the Sermon on the Mount about dealing with your father in Matthew chapter 6, it's language connected to the two great promises that kick off this gospel, the promise made to Abraham and his family, the promise made to David and his family. God made that promise to Abraham and his family that he would use this family to roll back sin and bring blessing. God made that promise to David that he would build a house or a family dwelling for David through his own son. So family language is really important. It identifies who we are and cuts to the core of our emotions. And so Jesus then not only raises the question, but look there in verse 49 and 50, he then answers his own question. And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven, that person is my brother and sister and mother. Matthew's description of Jesus' answer is striking, I think. Now, I just might be slower than you guys, but think about it. How often do you hear of a physical gesture of Jesus described in the Bible? Well, we have them with the healings, but an action like stretching out his hand. And do you notice who he refers to? It's different to verse 46, isn't it? Did you notice that? He's not referring to the crowds. Not referring to the religious leaders, who's he referring to? The disciples. It's a very specific gesture to a very small audience in that big sea of humanity in front of him. He's not talking about the crowd. He's not talking about the religious authorities. He's bringing his disciples in, the whole-hearted student followers of Jesus. That's what disciple means. Whole-hearted student follower of Jesus. Remember how much of the house the tenant wants last week? All the house. And then he explains his gesture. Did you see that in verse 50? Very important pattern in the Bible to pick up. Physical symbols always have explanatory words with them. Baptism, the Lord's Supper, Jesus throwing his arm out. Physical symbols have words to explain them. And so Jesus explains his physical action, referring just to the disciples, doesn't he? And he describes the disciples in family terms. Those who are seated at his feet as students, wholeheartedly and wholly committed to him and his teaching, that's his mob. And then he unpacks it, pulls it apart, drawing out the family likeness there in verse 50. It's worth pulling those words apart. Uh, It's an explanation of the family likeness. I might have Joseph's nose, I might have Mary's ears, but this is my family. This is my family. My eternal family is based on discipleship. Did you notice that the family is open to whoever? Did you notice that? Any person who bears the image of God, any human being, whoever. Did you notice that the family is identified by a verb? Does. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven. 
The family likeness is obedience. Obedience to the revealed will and word of God. Now at this point, again, we need to pause and remember three key ideas. Jesus is not describing how to get in. Remember the present tense? He's describing the family likeness, the family resemblance, the buffy hair, the glasses, and the cheeky grin that we just saw with the Baileys. He's not saying good deeds get you into the family. Please hear me correctly. Jesus is not saying that good deeds get you into the family because, second thing to remember, cast your mind back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 22 and following, the section just after where Lyndon read. If you remember that section, Jesus has just said, I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets. Your righteousness must be better than those professional law keepers. And let me show you how you'll never even get close. Six parts of the law. Do not murder, do not commit adultery. Jesus cuts the legs out under any CV that's based on good deeds to get in. So in the context of Jesus' teaching, his disciples are taught way back in Matthew chapter 5 that good deeds will not get you in. By your own nature, you will never measure up to the Father's standard of perfection. No human, by their nature, can obey the Father's will. Which brings me to the third thing to remember. There's only one who's obeyed my Father's will in heaven, isn't there? Did you notice that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17? I've come to obey perfectly the law which is given to show what God is like. That's Jesus. And if you remember from our series there way back two or three years ago, to be connected to him is crucial, isn't it? Jesus is saying very clearly that getting into the family of Jesus is not about your good deeds, but about being connected to him. The only one who has done the will of my Father in heaven. By being connected to him, by taking him at his word, by trusting him, we're granted his perfect obedience. Remember Ephesians, in Christ, you have everything that Jesus has achieved in his life, death and resurrection. And once you're in the family, you display the family likeness shown in the eldest boy. Like our brother, the perfect son, we too obey our father's will. Remember Colossians? We bear the family likeness being remade in the image of our creator. The family of Jesus is very easy to identify. It's not by biology. It's not by genes. It's not by family customs or traditions or rituals. It's not by your heritage. It's by faith in the eldest son expressed in our obedience just like him. It's been connected to Jesus who obeyed his father in heaven and brought us in by trusting in what he had done and now we bear that likeness. Now can I say, we're all from families, aren't we? I don't know what your week's been like as a family. Some of us had great weeks, haven't we? Some of us had terrible weeks. That's why this language is so resonant. It describes the week we've had. And it will describe the week coming up. This is a family, Jesus is saying, and I will unpack that in a moment. And like a family, that language covers everything from the highs to the mucky depths. Who's in the family? Well, Jesus is very clear. It's not about religious ritual, pedigree of goodness, family tree, custom gene, biology or heritage. Jesus is very clear. The members of his family are identified by active obedience to the will of our Father in heaven. Jesus has been very clear. There is only one man who has ever done that, our eldest brother. 
who obeyed his father perfectly. Jesus has been very clear. Take him at his word, trust him, and his obedience is freely given to you. Jesus is very clear. Once you are connected to him, you will bear the family likeness. You are in the family and you will bear the likeness of obedience to our Father in heaven. Jesus is very clear. That's available to whoever. Without regard to your history, your skin colour, your education, location, employment, or any other man-made division. So let me close with some observations and questions. And the first is a very simple one, because I think Jesus is posing this to the crowd and the religious leaders as he refers to the disciples. Are you in Jesus' family? Are you in Jesus' family? It's as simple as being connected to the one Son of God who obeyed his Father perfectly. It's that simple. If you are connected to Jesus, you're in the family. It's that simple, that assured, that certain. You're in a family in all its circumstances, all its muckiness, all its greatness, all of its eternal permanence if you are connected to Jesus. If you are connected to Jesus and you are in the family, how do you know the will of our Father in heaven? How do you understand what it means to bear the family likeness? How is that possible? Again, it's as simple as there is a book in front of you that has the word of God in it and we can read it. We can talk it to each other. We can listen to it. And there is the will of our Father in heaven. And let me reassure you, I think this period of intense conflict finishes on this purposefully warm note, doesn't it? Of this is my family. Like I said at the start, I don't know what your week with your family has been like. I don't know what it will be like i got an inkling about mine. But in this family, we are together because of our eldest brother, aren't we? And so as you look around, and please don't all step on your seats and look around together at once, but as you look around, you will see an invitation to coffee. You will see a face of a person you need to ring this week. You will see someone who's not here at the family gathering and you might follow them up. You will see invitations to dinner and breakfast, to time together, to holidays away, to prayer meetings, to time in the Word, to the family stuff we do together. So please, at the end of today, look around. Look at the family. Know that the likeness is being born because of the eldest son and brother who perfectly obeyed his father. Look at the way you might exhort each other in active obedience born out of that faith and delight in such a great family forever. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your family. Uh, To even pray, Father, is remarkable. Uh, to be able to come before the one who speaks things into existence, who knows our hearts, who exposes our sin, who pays for our sin in the costly life, death and resurrection of his own boy. To be able to come before you and say, Father, is just wonderful. Father, thank you that you've brought us into the family because of your son, because he obeyed your will perfectly, because he took our judgment for sin sufficiently, rose from the dead to show that our separation had been ended. Father, help us to trust in him and trusting in him. Please work in us the obedience to your will.
that is the family likeness. In Jesus' name, amen. Any questions? Well, as the fam- Yeah, go for it, Kayla. Yeah, I, I think it's both. I think it's both. Um, and I think as we were, if we were there, we would have picked up both of those more relevantly because we would have been physically there because you, you're standing there going, hang on, Pharisees, scribes, religious teachers, we know where they stand before God and Jesus just told us that they don't. And so disciples is a really important term. I, I preached a series in We War. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, disciple not Christian. I had a number of questions about that, which was the intention of the sermon title. Christian is a very easy label to grab. (laughs) Disciple is a lot more holistic, isn't it? And so the words for us as readers are important now because we miss the physicality of being present. So we're meant to notice, and and it's really important. It's one of the things that... Struck home, I thought, far out, three years at Bible college, and I'd never noticed that about Matthew 12. But we're told the three audiences, aren't we? Verse 46, he's teaching the crowd. Verse 49, he only refers to the disciples. And verse 45, well, that's the evil generation who's watching on. So I think for us, we're meant to pick up the pictures, but if you were there at the day, you would have picked up the location I think aware of that, we now put all of those together. Yeah. So we meant, I, I think one of the things for us as readers is pick up the picture language. A repetition of outside is really striking. Okay. The biological family is outside. The eternal family is inside. What's the distinction? It's not DNA, it's discipleship. So we meant to pick all of that up. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's just me rambling. Yeah. But but uh, Kayleen's picked up a really important point. Be careful, readers. Luke is really striking. Luke is always making sure you know the audience for those particular words. And Matthew's dived into that, hasn't he? Teaching the crowd, referring to the disciples, the evil generation listening in. Who's Jesus speaking to? Yeah.